We're going to do a prelude first. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to this uh, beautiful building and on this beautiful sunny day. Now, I thought it was going to rain today, but um, I'm glad that it's not. It's pretty and sunny. And um, if I see some new people over there that I haven't seen before in the corner, welcome. Nice to see you. I hope to get to see you after the service. Um, my name is Reverend Lisa Kirk. We're doing a, a service today called Bird Song, and I hope that you all like it very much. Like it very much, a whole lot. <laughs> okay. Any announcements? Thank you. 
And Andrew Rickstrand, who is a question of his doctorate of the SmackDown. We like this chalice, the um, flame of fire, spark of the universe, that warm our ancestral heart, the Now join us in our affirmation, number 470. We affirm the unfailing renewal of life. We affirm the steady growth of human companionship. We affirm a continuing hope. Let us go 
Join us for our responsive reading, number 648 in your hymnal. It's called Beginners. But we have only begun to love the earth we have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Surely our river cannot already be hastening into the sea of non-being. Not yet, not yet. There is too much broken that must be mended. We have only begun to know the power that is in us if we would join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. It's unfolding, it must complete its gesture. So much is in the bud. That's a bee. Now join us for our next hymn, number 144. Thank you. 
The sun had just passed the wedge, marking halfway, crossing the line of ascent towards its journey into day. That's what Jeremy Osborne thought as he walked the two hut beach sands of Ottawa, Maine. It was early morning or early afternoon when the temperature typically rose to 124 degrees. With construction boots to protect his feet, he looked for clams, mussels, some kind of sea life. He'd been out there all morning since dawn was supposed to happen. But there was no dawn that day or the day before, and there would be no sunset. As the sun stayed high in the sky, there was no sea life, yet he kept looking, hoping. Jeremy, just 30 years old, had memories of a cooler earth, a sunrise and sunset, playing in the sand, building snowmen. And although a young boy, he picked up the angst of all the grown-ups who worried about the rising heat. He also could tell who the grown-ups were who didn't care about that. And now he has seen the effects of what is called the great warm, the increase of tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes from a boiling ocean, wildfires that no longer have a specific season and heat waves that take the highest tolls of life. This could be the beginning of a science fiction novel, yes? a prediction of times to come. As far as I know, there is no Jeremy Osborne, although there probably are a few in the world, or an Ottawa, Maine. But there may be a future where the sun is too hot, where there is no dawn, no sunset, no sea life. 2050 is coming. It was the year 2020 that everyone started looking toward 2050 as the determining year regarding whether or not our Earth and we would survive the climate crisis. Many believed that that 30 years was all we had left before the Earth would no longer be viable for humans to live. Many believed that the Earth would reinvent itself, but the humans would die off. After they got wind of the Museum of Science and Industry's creation of the Department of Next, inviting science fiction writers, business people, and scientists to brainstorm about what life might be like in 2050, the Christian Science Monitor decided to do their own version of this. They got a group of science fiction writers together and asked this one question. What will life be like in 2050? The idea that science fiction writers might be the people to ask came from the fact that in the past, they have very often predicted the future. P. 
people such as Gene Roddenberry, Jules Verne, and Isaac Asimov. Gene Roddenberry, who said, Star Trek says that it has not all happened. It has not all been discovered. That tomorrow can be as challenging and as adventurous at any time man has ever lived. Jules Verne, how many things have been denied one day only to become realities the next? He predicted that we would travel to the moon. The distance between the earth and her satellite are a mere trifle, he said, and undeserving of serious consideration. I am convinced that before 20 years are over, one half of our earth will have paid a visit to the moon. Isaac Asimov said, science fiction writers foresee the inevitable and although problems and catastrophes may be inevitable, inevitable, solutions are not. These men dreamed up technical wonders such as submarines, handheld communication devices, and touchscreen computers decades before they became reality. In light of this, businesses, civic organizations, government agencies have met with science fiction writers for brainstorming and discussion. Some are hiring these authors to help develop visions of what can happen in the future. Pricewaterhouse Coopers, an international network of firms serving as consulting agencies for cybersecurity and privacy, published a corporate guide titled Using Science Fiction to Explore Business Innovation. And the Harvard Business Report wrote a report titled, Why Business Leaders Need to Read More Science Fiction. In the Christian Science Experiment, most of the writers agreed that technological advances, as in the past, aren't the topic of their stories, as much as what our societies can do with the technology we have. Author Mary Robinette Koval shared our two options. She said, stay and fix our planet or travel into space before we run out of time. In her novel, Goldilocks, another author, Laura Lamb, wrote about setting up space stations to live in where there would be views, to live in where there would be views of the earth. It was described as a little vulnerable thing in the grand scope of the universe. A little vulnerable thing. Think about that. Many of the authors have been writing about alternative societies, how we as people can save the planet and ourselves through green communities, urban concentration. As the oceans and forests become less and less viable, we will have to build small urban centers with greens, trees, vegetables, electric transportation, and groups of people to maintain it. In New York City, there was talk about demolishing an historic elevated railroad, which had not been used since the 1990s. When a citizen noticed that there were wildflowers, bees, and greenery growing there, with no prompting from man or woman. And so a committee was put together to save it. Now it is called the High Line and is a park that is loaded with oxygen producing trees and beautiful greenery. It is a sanctuary where one can walk high above the city streets. Kristen Kimball, author of The Dirty Life on Farming, Food and Love tells of her adventures creating a 500 acre organic farm near Lake Champlain in New York. Most of their machinery is horse driven. They use no pesticides or herbicides. They use composted manure and crop covering. With a very diverse product line that includes everything, beef, cattle, chickens, pigs, vegetables, fruit, grain, milk, cheese, and maple syrup, they grow enough food to feed 100 people a day. Thus, they have reached their goal at the start, which was at the start, 
to grow enough food for a community. There's hardly a person who visits who doesn't leave a box, leave with a, with a box full of food. Another example of a successful organic farm is the watershed farm of Pennington, New Jersey. This 55 acre watershed run by Jim Kinsel provides food for a 2,500 member CSA using row cover, a lightweight porous covering to keep that keeps out pests and an alley, Alice G tractor for cultivating and weeding. Jim is farming in an organic and sustainable way, keeping our earth healthy in his tiny corner of the world. The Alice G tractor, by the way, is a 1940s gasoline powered tractor that many farmers are refurbishing and converting to electric. Today, Watershed leases land for other farmers to grow their crops and add rich, healthy foods to the community. I'm sure everybody in this room knows one farm, one organic farm that produces food for CSAs, restaurants, um, farm to table types of situations. These farms and so many others, even in our communities, are feeding communities with healthy life-giving food. They are nurturing our earth and our ecosystem at the same time. They are doing no harm and they are doing it for love and for the health of our world. Their dedication and hard work is part of the solution. But they can't do it alone. The other part is the support of the people who buy the food, who live in the community, who make it possible for farmers to continue on and to make a living. Neither will survive without the other, not in the long run. We must embrace this idea, at least. As Kristen Kimball says, what made it work were the people in our little town. They embraced us. These are perfect examples of what can happen when people put their efforts together. And it is real, not science fiction. And one more thing, this guy by the name of Bill McGibbon, he's a journalist for Time Magazine. He wrote in 2020 about a fictional course the world took for 30 years to save our earth. It's 2050, he looks back. With America's return to the Paris Agreement, an international agreement for countries to purposefully work to reduce carbon emissions, keeping warming limited, things were looking up. With Greta Thunberg and her group of young activists, the world finally listened. There was extreme dedication. Climate change became the number one priority all over the world. The attachment to fossil fuels became less viable as citizens stopped supporting the big companies that supported the fossil fuel industries. Because of this, going green became more politically savvy. And for those who generally refused to give up their gasoline run cars and their huge homes by the waterfront, McGibbon added this solution to his story, the inability to get insurance. As in the science fiction stories, people created concentrated urban towns with green spaces. Low carbon transportation got people around. Private automobiles were not allowed in the towns. Farming rose as the way to eat and make money. This also supported migrants who had the skills. In general, the people were more fair, better educated in the solutions and healthier. McGibbon wrote, what's changed most of all is the mood. People ate better, so felt better physically and emotionally. They got more and better rest, more hard exercise. Overall, they were happier and friendlier. The disregard or it won't affect me attitude had waned with the clear indication that this problem was not going away and nobody was immune. Hearing, not just listening, to our children who are rightfully angry 
and believe it is everybody's responsibility to save their future. Finding an awareness that it can be done, it can be done, that with support and courage, the willingness to give up life as it is and create something new, not just because we want to, but because we have to and we can do it. And finally, I cannot go without, well, I cannot go without mentioning one of our first environmentalists who taught us awareness of our impact on our, on our earth with our actions. Rachel Carson, who saved the birds. Beautiful bird on the front of your order of service today. She turned the whole scientific world upside down. There is so much to say about her and her work, but let's leave it at this. Without her legacy, we would not, at the very least, have the bird song in our gardens. And so this sermon is dedicated to her. My dear friends, in this spring, planting time of year, as you use, we often have services that celebrate the awakening of the earth, the flowers showing themselves, the buds on the trees. After a dark time, these things provide hope, which I think this season really is all about. Hope that our earth will replenish herself, that the birds will return and the animals will come out of hibernation and that we will have a few months of all that nature has to offer, except for snow. <laughs> Sunshine, refreshing rain showers, days full of light and then darkness as we rest, ultimately a colorful display of leaves as we move into fall, hope that the earth and we will make it through another season. This is a real concern. Many scientists and environmentalists believe that it is not too far-fetched that we may not sustain the way we are living much longer than 2050. The science fiction stories that tell of a sorry future have the capacity to bring forth hope by getting people active in working to avoid it. Christopher Brown, author of Tropic of Kansas, says that one cannot write a science fiction story nowadays without including the climate crisis. In Tropic of Kansas, he describes an American dystopia of violence, poverty, and an unfriendly climate. And then he writes green cities and the restoration of urban areas. He put forth the idea that everybody has to be willing to be a little uncomfortable in this battle. His thought is that reading this will get people moving. The basic thought process for most of the authors, whether writing about space travel, alien invasion, viral epidemics, saving the earth and the people by changing the way we live is that our societies need to evolve and reorganize. It's the social side of the future that will make it possible for us to carry on. Tade Thompson in his novel, Rosewater, said it well, and I quote, we now have to use words like harmonization, like how can we work in harmony with the places we live in and the people that we live with? Harmony, sounds like a good idea. May it be so. Now's the time to share our joys, our concerns with each other. Yesterday, I had some movies that are small and they work with smile, like smile tap of a metropolitan opera. They did it on July, which is the 
which I have seen many times. And uh, it was a wonderful production. I mean, I don't know if you were talking about that, I just love it. But this time I saw it a little differently. This is a sexual predator who was brought to him. And <laughs> I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was great. I was just saying, it was fun. Oh. Uh, I wanted to talk about you, but there's a gentleman here who uh, hasn't been here for 10 years. Uh, and uh, we've been paying off the loans for some of the competitors who us. And the last she probably heard was that she was that last general with his soul. Pretty bad shape. They had to open their cells and leave the pressure. Uh, and I guess they put the cell pieces back together. Uh, but she's home, home being the best of the world. And uh, even staying in a place by herself. So she can still use her hair as a So, what instructs someone, what they're talking about this morning, is that um, I have a nephew who uh, writes to the AP, and he, his, he's stationed in Maine, and he covers ocean. And he wrote an article this week in how computers have is diminished to the point where you're not going to be getting that in your fish and chips in the near future because they're all fish. And, you know, if, you, if we are conscious of the way we eat and the way we harvest, we need to be really conscious of that. And then the other thing is that I was just explaining to Lisa because um, I wasn't thinking in terms of what we're talking about this morning, but I have been walking yesterday in the brain, in the woods, oh my god, I swear, in the ponds, the egrets, and we were small birds. And there was a hawk, and it was just stunning. The, the, the views were beautiful. And you couldn't count the colors of the green. We were, we were talking about which is really forest green. There were so many different shades of green. It was stunning. Issues of equal rights are under threat 
both legislatively and socially. Uh, so um, I think this is why we uh, do what LGBTQ folks expect of the Unitarian Church, which is be supportive, be an ally. I have myself a, a beautiful joy. Yesterday, I had gone out in the rain with a friend of mine to New Bedford to go help feed and clothe the homeless. A service called my Mobile Ministries from St. Paul's uh, Methodist Church. He's been doing it for 14 years. And I had gone and made some donations. And he had said, oh, all my people, the volunteers have canceled. Do you want to help me out with my truck? And my friend said, sure. I'll do it. We went out in the rain and we saw many people. I swear they had to have been 150 people that showed up in the rain and they got themselves their food, their sandwiches, their clothing, the things that they wanted. And everyone walked away without even worrying about how soaking what they were, but they were smiling. And George, who runs it, said, Imagine that on a wet, rainy day, people come out and had no concern about the rain, but they were concerned about themselves for saying, and they get some clothes and food and stuff, and that's what they get. And they all left happy, smiling, and not going to wait for It was such an experience to see how people can just say, hey, it's raining, it's snowing, it's cold, it's hot. But it wasn't their concern. They were there because George said his prayer and said, hey. And they all showed up. And that was an amazing feeling in the pouring rain. I got soaking wet with no one. I went home, <laughs> you know, get wet clothes, you wake them up, you're boom, you're done. The others that were out there had to continue their day until they get to a shelter with soaking wet clothes. So when the people say, oh, all the time, oh, it's the weather. And even George says, no matter what, cold, rain, snow, rain, they show up. And they will. And I was so happy to see that the joy that people had in their face on receiving something like that. It was, it was a blessing. And that's my day. I'm excited. Thank you. And now for all the silent joys and concerns that we keep within, may we continue to hold on to the bright light in the world, hold on to the joy, the joy and the happiness. And may all of your pains and your sorrows be brought into the light and may all of your happiness be shared with others. Amen. And now, our hymn 123. Please remain seated. silence.
Blessed be. This religious community exists by its mission as a fire exists by burning. But a fire cannot burn without fuel. And it is the time, the energy, the imagination, the vision, the creativity, the compassion, the love, and the financial support of the members and friends of this community that fuels your mission to nurture and sustain a welcoming, inclusive and diverse liberal religious community that transforms lives and serves the world. Your support, the free and generous support of each and every member and friend of this community is what fuels this community and its mission. And without that, the flame of justice and community and love cannot burn brightly to warm ourselves and be a beacon in a world threatened by division and fear. So I ask you today, please be generous with your support and with your offering. Now let us join for our final hymn, number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Thank you. 